Yeah. Good morning, all the students. Um, today we'll have a small uh, video. I think it is uh, sufficiently large enough to engage us for an hour, which will uh, watch and stop it or pause it in the between to discuss on some concepts that are uh, shown in the video. And you'll be surprised to see that most of the concepts what we have learned in the course are being implemented in that video. You will see lots of real examples and also some new um, aspects where you can see the applications of machine learning are also shown in this video. Okay, so I think this will turn out to be interesting for you. Let's um, start featuring it. Alexa, play classical music. Here's a station for classical music. Well, my name is Jerry Nice. I'm 70 years old. I live in an active adult community for people 55 and over here in San Jose, California. I actually have uh, five desktops, four laptops, two Kindles, and uh, an iPad. Uh, I have Amazon Alexa. I've had her for a couple of years now. And as someone that didn't even see my first television until I was seven years old, I can tell you that the evolution of technology is inevitable. It benefits mankind. You can see the stars in the Milky Way. Well, I can actually spend all day under here. Artificial intelligence is all around us. And we use it in different ways every day. You wake up, you go for a run, and you watch, tracks where you're going, measures your heart rate variability, these informs of AI. Probably AI was used by a farmer to grow the crops, the strawberries and the blueberries that I had for breakfast. Maybe you're in a car, it's AI that makes sense to the vehicle from the world around it. You sit down at your computer, start to use your email, you filter by the you take a photograph, and the tools that help you sort your photographs is your AI too. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's becoming ever more present. What is the temperature in San Jose, California? It's the biggest revolution today. And it's on the order of the agricultural revolution in the past. I think technology is going to have a really hard time helping people like me. This is a lot of hard. This is a lot One of the great things about machine learning is how it's been democratized. It's sort of huge jump has happened. It's when you're getting confronted with the fact that I might not be driving a car in the next 10 years. Because it's software, the rate of change is so much faster. This technology will be created. We have no escape from it now. People may think AI is going to take over the world. They're definitely nervous. Some of those dystopian things that we might think, oh, that could never happen, might actually happen. To me, it's not what's going to happen to us, but what's possible to happen with us. And where can we go? I mean, it's sort of unlimited. Uh, students, can you quickly mention what are the various technologies used so far? We have seen facial recognition and many such kind of technologies, right? So far in the video you have watched, can you mention some um, such applications of machine learning? Sarfraz? Mehani, you're watching, right? Or you logged in and um, simply doing some other work? 
autonomous driving vehicles we have seen right facial recognition systems and constellation watching and for every and alexa speech recognition system lots of technologies are being uh, sorry lots of applications of machine learning are discussed here right so these will be further discussed in a more elaborate way for um, in the further video let's watch we are progressing <laughs> rapidly in ai companies are putting billions of dollars into it the smartest people in the world are studying it it is going very very fast but the tools are accessible even the ignorance can learn about it Good morning, guys. Today we're going to be working and talking a little bit about something called artificial intelligence. What do you think of when you hear those two words, artificial intelligence? Things like in video games, label on top of them AI. When I think of artificial intelligence, I think of like how smart robots are. How smart robots are, okay. So, Brandy, I'm going to show you guys and introduce you to an artificial intelligence password robot called Sophia. Please wake up and say Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sophia. I can use my expressive face to communicate with people. For example, I can let you know if I feel angry about something or if something has upset me. Why is it so important to have an expressive face given that you're a robot? I want to live and work with humans, so I need to express emotions to understand humans and build trust with people. Can robots be self-aware, conscious, and know they're robots? Well, let me ask you this. See, in addition to speech recognition, now robots are uh, still more advanced. They're even working on emotion recognition, right? So when robots are to work with people, they should be able to understand the people's emotions and also the context in which they are working with the people. So they should be able to learn the people's emotions and um, the uh, lifestyle of the people it is working with. And based on that, it has to perform certain tasks, right? For that, this robot is equipped with even emotion recognition also. <laughs> I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. How do you guys feel about living in a world with robots like Sophia? <laughs> Not, you guys wouldn't be too happy about that? Would you guys trust your babysitter being a robot like Sophia? <laughs> Well, even if I am get over it. Thank you very much. People are always scared about the future, and they have this kind of twin dynamic going on. On the one hand, it's like, woohoo, total optimism. The other is like, oh god. <laughs> we know in our bones that things are going to be different because they always have been. A lot of uh, dystopia, uh, doom, uh, talking is not really based on facts. People are uh, looking at things they don't understand. When you want to talk about AI, you've got to talk about data and machine learning and algorithms and sensors and whatever binds it all together. Okay, I, I today, it's important to understand what this what is. It is able to learn highly repetitive data. It's effectively a computer brain that can truly learn and change. That to me is what the real vision of AI is. There's an abundance of data now. We record what we eat, what we watch, what we listen to, where we go. In a way, we're recording the DNA of our lives. And there's tremendous challenges in taking this data and transforming it into actionable decisions. This course is unique because it's... 
So artificial intelligence, machine learning as a subset of artificial intelligence will be one of the most... Now students, did you observe one thing when we are watching a video on machine learning and artificial intelligence, even we are the, the, the uh, recommender system behind this YouTube, it understood that we are interested in that topic. That is why it is targeting the videos also around it. That is why just now we have got a recommendation to join uh, to a recommendation of a course on data science and artificial intelligence. Did you observe that? So this is how AI and machine learning is intertwined in order to uh, build better recommendation systems. Most of the advances humanity has ever made, because. It will make machines fundamentally different from the way they are now. They won't just be faster, higher resolution. They'll be thoughtful in a way they aren't now. And this will be embedded not just in computers, but in all kinds of devices everywhere. It's going to change a lot about how our economy works and how our society functions. In the immediate term, the most realistic way that we'll all interact with AI is in self-driving cars. Everything we do in life is about more and more efficiency, it's about productivity. Self-driving cars could make all of us so much more productive. That is probably the most exciting possibility. When I first rode in an autonomous vehicle, I could see that this was going to change the way we track. Yeah, did you observe here? These autonomous vehicles are having uh, cameras and sensors put on top of the vehicle, uh, which we have seen in neural network um, uh, application, where the sensors will sense the vehicles around it and it will learn the environment and based on it, based on the pictures taken by the camera, it will process the data, it will process the environment uh, parameters and it will suggest the uh, machine or uh, the self-driving vehicle to take some appropriate step either in forward direction, taking in a, a diagonal direction, or um, uh, ha making it to stop if at all there are uh, more vehicles on the road and there is no path to go forward. All this kind of processing or evaluation is done through neural networks, which process the data that is captured by sensors and cameras that are installed on the vehicle. Okay, so it works dynamically real time an autonomous vehicle, I could see that this was going to change the way we transport ourselves, we move our goods, you know, greater economy, greater efficiency, greater convenience, greater safety. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I just turned off the car driving with okay, my hands. I'm not touching the wheel at all. My feet aren't on the pedals at all. So this is fully autonomous driving. This is Carla, Udacity's self-driving car. This is one of the sensors that Carla uses to see the world around her. The LiDAR works by pretty much shooting laser beams around and bouncing them off of surrounding objects. And we're able to use that to build up a point cloud map of the surrounding world. Yeah, and did you understand here? The sensor will send laser beams and when it gets reflected, immediately it will locate an object because the signal is being reflected or the laser beam is being reflected. Based on that, they are creating a cloud map of the surrounding objects and that will be sent as input to the machine or this uh, autonomous driving vehicle and immediately it evaluates that environment and takes a decision to move forward. And so what we're doing right now is following a set of waypoints around the lot, pre-recorded ahead of time by having someone drive around the parking lot with the LiDAR on the roof. And so that's kind of where the machine learning aspect comes into play, because the more data that you have to train your systems on, the better your systems will learn. So one of the great benefits of self-driving cars is they all learn from another. They share their maps. They share just like they see. One self-driving car makes a mistake, a mistake in the database, and then ideally, other cars will make mistakes. 
So they're continually getting smarter over time. So this is where adaptive learning comes into picture, right? So whenever some collision happens on the road, that is also taken as a data to train the vehicle so that in future it will not make such kind of mistakes while driving. Okay, and that um, because this requires more and more data to train the vehicle on, uh, it takes data not only from that particular car, but different cars, all types of uh, cars which have been driven in different types of environment. Okay, all that data will be consolidated and trained uh, to make an autonomous driving vehicle more error free. And as it goes on driving, it doesn't terminate its training period. Once it is trained, it is not that it is no longer um, uh, need to be trained and it can um, uh, go on uh, with its experience. No, it is not like that. It is adaptively trained. Because in the real time, it is not that it encounters only one or two situations. It may encounter dynamic situations in um, uh, among which some situations may be in which it hasn't encountered at all so far. That is why it has to adaptively learn in various environments how to drive without any uh, accidents or collisions. When you see the way my car is driving around, a lot of them, you will still see a person, not just in the driver's seat, but actually driving. They're just driving through and gathering that data, but the car is not driving itself just yet. We're definitely not to the point where I could just say, hey, Carla, take me home from work, although that would be great. The future is coming, but it's not quite here yet. So we come here every other month to learn about machine learning and self-driving and uh, you know, figuring out the technology that we need so that we don't need to drive. Thanks to the Googles of the world putting a lot of the code in the open source, we now have the ability to do things that were PhD theses just five or ten years ago. You can go to the cloud and you can basically do supercomputer work essentially for free. One of the things I love about DIY robo cars is that you think about self driving cars and you think, oh, that's just stuff that Tesla and Waymo are working on. But because it's so accessible now, it's a bunch of hobbyists in Berkeley doing it themselves. The difference between what we do and what the big guys do is that we risk. And we crash a lot. The traditions of the car industry is always been to innovate through competition through racing. But with autonomous cars, it's too risky. Bad brands, they're expensive. <laughs> So we're doing the kind of the racing, the competition, the nimble, aggressive driving that the big guys aren't willing to do. You can probably expect that to reduce the nature of side effects. We just sort of immerse themselves and start to have new ideas. We are Janiji, and this is my wife. And we're a team spotter. <laughs> I've been building model cars since I was little. And I met a lot of folks here at this middle. I can actually participate in machine learning. I can learn it. By driving through the camera is taking pictures of what it sees. So basically it's saying when you see this image, then you're going to predict, okay, I'm going to turn X angle and I'm going to be going at a certain speed. So that's the output of our prediction. And it's actually going to learn from what it's done. And so this is really when you hear people talking about neural networks, this is basically a super simplified way. So easy. This is what our brain will 
looks like. Probably what another thing is, is it's very important for us to understand what artificial intelligence is. Artificial intelligence is based on connections, making connections. We're going to start off by playing a cool little game. You're going to say something about yourself. So, for example, I can say, I live in Queens. So, if anybody else lives in Queens, I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pass the string along to you. Now, the key thing that you guys got to remember is that we cannot let go of the string. Who has cats? <laughs> So a neural network is a form of artificial intelligence that's been designed very specifically based on neuroscience and based on our best understanding of how the human brain works. As we learn, our brain modifies what's called the synaptic strength, which is the interconnection between two processing units. The neural network is the same thing. The neural network actually starts off where you're defining these little layers. Convolutional 2D, convolutional 2D, and linear, linear, linear. These are types of layers that you, you get in these. So what is this convolutional neural network? We have learned about single layer neural networks using perceptrons and then multi-layer neural networks and back, back propagation algorithm in order to correct the neural network to predict uh, with good accuracy. Right? And if you have many layers of such neural networks, then we call them as deep neural networks or convolutional neural networks. And in order to perform some image recognition or in order to perform some uh, classification between the images or in order to do some faster evaluation, in such cases, we may require this uh, multi-layer uh, multi -layer neural networks, which are also called as uh, convolutional neural networks, okay? These neural networks. And then you hook them all together. School can be boring. <laughs> you say this layer connects to this layer. I like hot dogs. Anybody else like hot dogs? I like hot dogs. You say this one talks to that next one, the next one talks to that one. And once you've done it, you've built a neural net. So what do you guys notice forming between us? It forms a bridge sort of like there's connections in between us. There's connections in between us. Does everyone here have a connection with each other? Knowing those similarities and voices of them helps us create a network between us. The same way neural networks help computers and machines make connections and learn how to learn things. So there's a lot of different things neural networks can be set up to do. They need to train to the task. Like, for example, image classification. So say this is an image of a dog. You get a whole bunch of examples of dogs. And also a data set of non-dogs. Those are the inputs to the neural network. And then the output is something that you're trying to learn how to do with the image to distinguish dogs from non-dogs. So I can start shoveling this data into this neural network. You know this image over here? That needs to go over here in this 3D geometry space. And so it goes, okay, I can do that. And then you do another image, and another image. This neural network is basically learning from example. It starts learning basically how to transform from this image space into this geometry space. It starts getting better and better and better and better and better. And after enough examples, the computer forms in its own brain rules. That it can't even explain, but they make it as competent as people are. Now you don't look at problems the same way. You look at it like, can I capture enough data so that a machine can figure out what's going on? One of the biggest areas of application is in medical imaging and medical diagnostics. I've seen some research papers that shows that like neural networks can, for example, spot malignant tumors. And possibly they, they do so better than a human. At Stanford, we have a team that trained the neural network with 129,000 images of various species, lesions of ashes and species, including melanomas, deadly skin cancers, and an iPhone, and the answer is yes.
and then we're able to document the see this is the most interesting application right image recognition is actually uh, tweaked to uh, find cancer skin cancer by analyzing various images um, uh, that it has been trained on right so when a new image is given to it based on its experience it has drawn from 28000 images approximately uh, that it is fed with it will understand uh, how a lesion looks like and what would be the characteristics of a lesion which is having uh, cancerous cells okay so based on its experience it will try to predict whether that uh, mark on the skin is a cancerous one or not that is a very interesting application right the phone is really as good as the best human physicians like Stanford level and Harvard level doctors. The fact that when you know, people release a paper describing their technology that they created, it often comes with code now. It means that we can download it, try it out, see if we can adapt it to the problems that we want and build on it. If you're smart and innovative and ambitious, you can use tools that are available to anyone to do your own experiments, to study science, to build things. I, I messed up like two times. After filming for six times, I got a job of the largest company. See, again, we had an advertisement um, show, suggesting another course on data science. Because of our uh, watching interest, they, uh, YouTube is targeting us, us with some advertisements, right? We noticed that he has been very curious, um, you know, as a young child. The main thing about Rishabh is that he wants to know about everything, how this stuff works. I did my first science fair in fourth grade, a very simple elementary project. And then I wanted to work on something more complex. All these like new AI products and features are coming out. So I wanted to start incorporating some of that into my programming to address like an actual problem. My name is Richard Jane and I am here to cure pancreatic cancer. And then a family friend passed away for, uh, from pancreatic cancer. What further pushed me to develop a solution for it? This right here, this yellow part is the pancreas. And the problem is essentially when the patient has pancreatic cancer, the tumor will be resting behind um, the pelvis, which is very hard to reach. And because of that, when doctors apply radiotherapy, they apply like an overlay around the pancreas, and that can sometimes cause other tissues and other cells to be damaged. That's where my hope comes in. I had 503 of these 3D images. So I had to call my network, take these images in, train on them, and then it was able to identify the different types of like textures that the pancreas had and the tumor had better than what a human could do. So my tool analyzes the patient's scan to uh, reduce that overlay around the pancreas to make sure that radiation is being applied to the right spot and the tumor becomes more effective. I want to actually do like a clinical trial. So first to do that, I'll need to continue like improving the accuracy and be able to run in real time. Machine learning. What this boy did is to uh, target or direct that treatment, um, radiotherapy treatment directly to the tumor area where uh, the tumor is actually lying. In normal cases, when that radiotherapy is applied or chemotherapy is applied, other tissues, some uh, healthy tissues also will be damaged because uh, the signals can't directly reach the tumor. But this boy is trying to um, apply neural network um, architecture here in order to uh, take various images of the um, uh, area around this pancreas and trying to filter out the healthy areas and only reach that tumored area where actually that radiotherapy uh, can be directed to.
okay and this is a very interesting application see this boy has uh, found the area where it can be exactly applied and he is inspired or actually he is um, this idea of him came out of his sorrow because he lost some relative because of this pancreatic cancer he got this idea like that the um, with the problems around you when you encounter some problems around you you try to find solution to them either directly or by applying technology like machine learning and artificial intelligence do not curse and keep cursing it uh, sorry uh, do not uh, start cursing it you just try to find a solution because you are now learning lots of um, uh, different kinds of technology right so you have to find solutions to the problems around you not others so you have to be inspired in that direction you have to think in that direction is computationally heavy in two different ways there's training the system actually doing the learning and then once you've built the system this brain that you've created you need to be able to and see this this neural network is working according to back propagation algorithm right it is propagating what it has um, uh, given us output back so that it can reduce the error in the prediction each time adjusting the weights of the parameters that it is taking as input that is what we see in perceptron training rule uh sorry uh, back propagation training rule right and it has to run really fast and this wouldn't be possible without really big gpus this is called a v100 it's the world's largest most complicated semiconductor ever made by man when packed into platforms like these it actually offers a petaflop of compute for context that's about 1000 trillion math calculations every second a gpu has a whole bunch of little teeny processors that are basically there to do one thing render pixels but here this ai learned 7000 different species of flowers this is running on a cpu you can see it's doing about 4 to 5 images every second but you put 1000 or 2000 of them together and all of a sudden you've got this huge supercomputer that's built for machine learning and we actually paralyzed it using one of our gpus and this is what it's able to do as scientists and engineers innovate and create new ai there's this intense pressure for both programmability and for speed the new generation of autonomous machines that does require much more higher computer the faster we can make the training process the more progress we make in ai my grandfather started the farm in 1950 you know my father grew up as a farmer and i grew up as one my kids are growing up into it as well you know the, the advancements in technology with the machines it's stuff that we have to learn all the time here so there are lots of ways that artificial intelligence can be used by farmers you can have drones that are using image recognition techniques to figure out where you should plant what crops need water right now you can use artificial intelligence as you model out the genes that you're building and that you're putting into seeds you can also use it for determining what kind of fertilizer to use and you can also use it inside the machines that pick strawberries or that take apples from trees so my instinct is that ai is going to help us it will expand our capabilities it will create new things for us to do it will free up time as a reason why almost all cool stuff has been invented in the last 150 years despite the fact that we now is thinking of how to do it that's because we freed ourselves of the burden to farm every day the single most important thing for ai to accomplish in the next say 10 years is to free up humanity from the burden of repetitive work yeah. okay so this one I'll fill it i guess i can't even wrap my head around self driving vehicles like right now that crane buggy is going to pull up alongside us there is ways for that machine to not have an operator in it but 
know, us as farmers, the, the one thing we enjoy is, is operating a machine. Not every job is gonna be able to be automated completely as far as field work goes. Uh, labor in the farming industry is a very hot topic right now. Often places they don't have enough, they can't find it. Populations are growing, there's more and more people, a lot more mouths to feed. So the focus really is how can we produce more feed with the same amount of land as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. Technology is where agriculture needs to go. I think there's no question that computers are going to be able to do what we do, make everything that we do faster and more efficient and make us more productive. So then we all say what we want, but ultimately, uh, being more productive means we need less people to do it. There's other people who said, well, look, when we went from horse and buggies to cars, you know, to that, really, you know, and jobs. No, we just sort of transitioned and, and morphed to something else. And then it's a matter of, is that going to be a good thing or a bad thing? And the reality is it's usually a little bit of both. There are real concerns that AI will get so good at single domain capability to produce results, to create value, and actually to do the jobs that humans do, so that job displacement could be a substantial issue. I think there's a path we can go down where we, we get more things right than wrong, and, and we end up seeing a ton of innovation and progress that makes our lives a lot easier and a lot better. But routine jobs are the first to be improved and made better, cheaper, faster using software. Technology has really taken on a role in our life that we just didn't predict, we did not expect. And there have been all these unintended consequences because of it. And so what are the mechanisms that we can put in place? What are the controls so that we feel like we still understand it, that we still have agency, that we can still sort of shape it, and it doesn't end up shaping us too much? What jobs will it replace? What jobs will it create? And in a world where there's more job churn, how do you prepare people? How do you educate people so they can most thrive in a slightly chaotic world that AI is going to create? The kinds of jobs that will happen for our children, I think, are going to be different from the jobs we have today. You don't even have to touch it. That's how we progress as a society. And how are we going to get increased productivity without automating things that people currently do? I'm hoping the machine cannot do what I do. I'm worried, though. Um, I'm worried, but I'm also excited in some ways that machines are going to be able to do a lot of this. It's interesting. Hello everyone, I'm an English Artificial Intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinguang as agency. We saw one of China's state news agencies in Xinhua um, announce their AI news anchor. An appearance a model on Jack and Zhao, a real anchor. It's definitely an overstatement to, to say this is a, an AI news anchor because I suspect the actual dialogue um, is, is, heavily, is heavily mediated. Right now, we really don't have AI that can strike up a real conversation or synthesize information together like a real journalist or, or news anchor would. I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as texts will be typed into my system uninterrupted. It's just as the beginning, right? So the nice thing about AI is it gets smarter with every iteration. Hello, I'm Siren, and I'm a digital human. I was created by an international team of artists and engineers who wanted to challenge our ideas of what a synthetic human could be. Digital Man is a visual effects production company. We do visual effects for movies. In 2008, we did uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. When you look at Brad Pitt, you're not looking at Brad Pitt. You're looking at a digital version of Brad Pitt. And ever since then, we've been trying to prove ourselves. 
and we said, you know what? I wonder if we could if we could do this live. If we could actually take this technology that we've been working on for 10 years to create the most photorealistic digital characters, and try to do it live. And did you hear about this motion capture movies recently uh, being released? Uh, they capture the motions from already existing uh, um, pictures of that particular person and they graphically replicate it okay, by making the uh, neural networks tr to be trained on those emotions. So that in a given context, they will take up that particular emotion to uh, depict that person, though he is not in existence. That is how motion capture works. And that's what we did before Marvel Infinity War. We did the lion's share of the Thanos War. What you can get is the ability to create a digital copy of somebody without having animators in between to actually render the images that we want to create at almost feature film quality in real time. The only way to do this this fast is with machine learning. It's really hard to do it really accurately. So what you need to do is train this neural network because that's the key thing behind machine learning. It's, it's all about the data. And we have a lot of data. And it starts out producing crap. I mean, it really would produce just a jumble of geometry. This is when it doesn't work. <laughs> Although my mom looked at this and said, hey, that's dog. <laughs> and eventually, after 24 hours of training, out pops something that looks like this. Every day, this gets better and better and better. So my performance can now drive any character that would be. This kind of technology can be very useful for us. Um, if I'm an actor, I can play a younger version of myself. As you age, maybe that isn't as much of a barrier. But ethically, you have to be really careful. With all our yesterdays of lighted fools, the way to dust. We've gotten to the point where we can create stuff that's really hard to distinguish from reality. I'm And if that's the case, how do you tell who's on the other side? Take my image and use it to control the face of somebody else in real time. What if you could buy online real estate and rent? This is super dangerous technology, and there's uh, open source software called DeepNik that will do similar kinds of stuff. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. The tools that were developed for high-end digital studios are now available for anyone. And that's great for making movies at home. It's allowed new forms of cinematic creativity. So what we observed here, uh, machine learning is like a two-sided sword, right? You are even able to fake your uh, some other person and uh, control what he says. You can just tell what he wa uh, what you wanted him to say and shoot that and use it for a bad purpose, right? So that should not be uh, the um, intention behind using the technology. It should uh, because it is a two-sided sword. You have to use it very carefully. Otherwise, you will be harmed if used in a wrong way. Not so, Not great, so great when it's used for deep fakes and manipulation. And now there are plenty of people out there posting manipulated video clips. Right now, the quality isn't great. You know, you can tell that they've been faked, but I think we can expect uh, the quality to get a lot better. So this is what the state of the art looked like in basically 2015. You can see it, that doesn't really look like Trump. You know, but but it was clear enough that we were going to get m much more realistic looking results. And, you know, at some point it, it was even even this is what I can do with my hacked version of this. Right. It's really only a matter of time before pretty much anyone can mimic anybody else with, with nothing more than an app.
One striking demonstration recently came from Berkeley where they showed that they can take a video of a professional dancer and then use it to animate a photo of, you know, a regular person who could not dance like that. And the result looks, looks pretty convincing. As the technology for rendering graphics continues to improve and the technology for synthesizing voices and videos continues to improve, there's kind of an arms race between the AI that's creating these things and the AI that would be detecting them. When I demo projects like this, people will criticize me and say, why are you trying to make it easier so that people can do this? Like, you see all the possibilities, and, and I do see the possibilities, which is why I actually try to put them in public in, in, in a sort of like, sometimes in a humorous light before the stakes are very high, so people can kind of understand, understand what's going on. So we're building this incredible technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and we're setting rules for it right now. And one of the big questions, one of the most important questions, is will we set the rules right? So AI will have all kinds of massive benefits. It will make us richer, lives better. But it can also be used to create filter bubbles that will give us certain information. It can be used to monitor our behavior, sell our personal information. You can imagine it going to insurance companies to look at our searches and deny us coverage. Or think about facial recognition technology. It's super useful, right? It helps you unlock your phone, all kinds of identification, but it can also be used for surveillance and tracking. So a lot of this stuff is happening now, and we need to think carefully about what it means as we develop this technology and figure out the role we want AI to play in society. It's absolutely the case that these new technologies will generate ethical dilemmas we haven't encountered before. For me, being able to start to critically interrogate what we're up to and why is hugely important. Today, we're in the age of artificial narrow intelligence. We have many AI applications that are good at specific things. For example, we can beat the world grandmaster at chess using an AI program. We can beat the world grandmaster at Go. But there is no AI system, for example, that can do true one-shot learning. When you give one example, and the AI system masters that, that concept. Now, on the other hand, think about the revolution that's coming in the air with artificial intelligence and autonomous aerial vehicles uh, numbering in the millions, far more than the thousands of aircraft that we see today. Human beings simply can't keep up with that. AI can maintain these systems with predictive maintenance. AI can fly these aircraft with autonomous control. AI can even manage and deconflict traffic. These are examples where AI can truly take us into the future, a future that man alone cannot manage. So there is a lot of PR about AI for good. People are scared of AI. So of course, companies are coming up with examples of how they're using AI for good. But on the other hand, it's real improvements. You help someone who couldn't see, see, that is good. It gives you good PR, but it's also good. I actually was born blind, but I was really lucky and it's a sort of fixable kind. And I span the whole visual spectrum from complete blindness to sort of pretty heavily impaired to doing a fine without much assistance. Uh, the Mac OS introduced this thing where you can shake the mouse really fast, it gets big, so you can find it. That's given me years of my life back. Like, I could have, like, all the time I've spent looking for a mouse on a computer screen, I could have, like, learned to play an instrument or, like, learned another language. When you don't know what you can't see, you almost don't know when you need help. You sort of feel like everything should be doable, but sometimes things aren't, and then you're like, oh, maybe there's something that could help me out here. I'm going to download the scene now and check it out. Hold the camera over a barcode to hear the product name. The faster the thing is, the closer you are to the barcode. I can imagine this being really useful in the grocery store. With a more traditional system, a lot of the programmer would be deciding what's of interest and what should be described very mechanically with the machine learning system, you know, showing the system, 
many, many thousands of photos and it is using a neural network to identify the pattern. And your surroundings to find out how many people are around you, how close they are, and their facial expressions. Do it. Are you Interesting. One face near bottom edge. 27 year old woman with brown hair wearing glasses looking neutral. All right. When I'm walking, I sort of just tough it out. I can't really tell what's going on around me. I know where all the environmental stuff is because you do it over and over again. People. So I get what I had some people could tell me, like, your friend is coming, right? Your friend is like over here to your left. That would be great. Chris near center three feet away. I got you eventually. The potential is really there to really like to change lives, to change my life even. AI will help understand the world around and making that the playing field for everyone. AI will give us back. Old people are using it. Why give them back capabilities they've lost? AI is going to be drive, giving them mobility. One of the ways that self driving cars work first is in contained environments where they've mapped all the roads, where the weather is predictable. The car does not need to be able to drive very quickly. There isn't a lot of traffic. People just need some help to get around. For myself, I'm still working. I'm perfectly capable of driving around. But living in a place, I have neighbors who are in their 90s who really can't. So this is my mom and my father, George Avakian. This is their home in Riverdale, where they became housebound because they couldn't drive any longer. Here were two really active, intelligent people, and they couldn't do anything without calling somebody to drive them. But it's really hard to be dependent on other people. For older people, I see the autonomous vehicles. Self-driving cars are, are uniquely positioned to help out seniors because uh, there's a lot of people here that shouldn't be driving anymore makes it easier for people to make a decision about stopping and driving it's when you have something that can take you down to the clubhouse or to the fitness center. These technologies are all helping seniors because they will allow us to live more independently longer and more safely. I really wish they'd had this for my parents. Yeah, it would have changed their life. At every stage, there's some way that AI helps. It's going to make our lives longer. It's going to make them richer. It's going to expand our imaginations. Some people say that AI is going to enhance our humanity. I don't know if that's true. This technology enhances our humanity. Twitter sure happens. It's a real place. So I'm not sure what is making us different. us different. That's for sure. What made this moment the way it is now is that we invited a whole lot of people into it. We didn't hold it quite right. On your mark, get set, go. So he's trying to be 33.33. He's saying, build things, here are platforms, imagine what's possible. 25.6. Yeah! 25.6. We think what we're doing with AI and ML is really good, but this is nothing compared to what the brain does. So we're nowhere close yet. 
like humans are still winning for them. <laughs> we, our processor is much better. <laughs> but you know, I guess the hope is that one day it'll be. Yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll get that. America's 2018 top young scientist is Sean James. <laughs> I realized that not every kid has the engagement and interaction with STEM in general. So I recently formed a nonprofit organization called Samyak Science Society. So I want to uh, further promote artificial intelligence in my community to help solve like real world problems. In the future, I think the house you have is going to be your car. Every time you take a shower, you're going to get a skin exam. Every time you look at the venting, you're going to get an eye exam. Every time you sleep, you're going to measure the weight distribution to understand whether you have a risk of a heart failure. Every time you touch a steering wheel in a car, you should get a skin exam. I believe we're going to invent five parts that are more effective in the world. I believe we're going to find a way to live twice as long. I believe we're going to find a way to seamlessly get into the information in our brains. So I think people really have to maintain that optimism. Technology has always helped human make progress. AI is an amazing technology. It's happening and it's exciting. A close up of a blackboard. It's also true that there are a lot of risks with AI. So we need to be thoughtful. We need to be deliberate as we move forward in this crazy new world that AI has created. You really don't know what the future can hold for you, but you gotta be ready for it. Okay, students, so you are able to understand the pros and cons of machine learning that have been discussed. And in the ending, you can see a person uh, telling what all uh, possible things machine learning can do. It will monitor the posture you sleep in. It will uh, take your ECG when you hold the, the steering of the car. Lots of, lots of applications of machine learning will actually uh, help us and sometimes even may dictate us the way we live okay so you have to understand before um, making an application before developing or designing an application you should understand uh, how much it is required and whether it will uh, really solve a potential problem or it is just used to enhance the people's living you have to think in that direction and then uh, build societally and environmentally friendly applications which would help the mankind okay so a question on this uh, video will be given to you as case study question in your third internet right okay then we'll meet in the next class bye